Welcome back to Chapter 5. In Section 5.3, we're going to talk about exponential functions. The topics are, we're going to evaluate the exponential functions, graph them, define the number e, and then finally solve exponential equations. First, let's use our calculator to approximate each number rounded to three decimal places. So let's do 2 to the 1.4. We're going to enter 2, and then this caret key right here means to the 1.4. Now, we're going to round it to three decimal places. So what you do is you look at the third decimal place, look to the right of it. Since it's smaller than 5, it's just 2.639. So that's the answer for the first one. Let's do 2 to the square root of 5. So 2 to the, now square root is in blue right here, so second square root, 5, then end parentheses. The reason we do that is we only want the square root of 5. So remember we're rounding to three decimal places. So here's our third decimal place. We look to the right, it's less than 5, so our answer is 4.711. Let's do the next one, 3 to the pi. 3 to the, now if you look Right here, you'll see our pi. So second, pi, and enter. We're rounding to three decimal places. This is my third decimal place. I look here. It's less than 5, 31.544. Let's get started by talking about the exponential growth. An exponential function is a function of the form f of x equals c a to the x, where a is a positive real number, and c is a real number, but it can't be equal to zero. The domain of f is the set of all real numbers. The base a is the growth factor, and c is the initial value. I've linked some examples using the exponential growth function for you to look at. Let's graph some exponential functions, and you're going to find something really interesting. So let's graph some exponential functions, and I think you're going to find something very interesting with these functions. So let's do the first one, 2 to the x. Okay, and this is just our standard viewing window. Let's try the next one. Let's do 4 to the x. Graph that one. Hmm, interesting. Here's 2 to the x, and here's 4 to the x. It's getting closer to the y-axis. If you had to guess, what do you think 6 to the x will do? Well, let's try it. And look at that, it's getting, getting even closer to the y-axis. And let's do our final one here, 10 to the x. And look at that, it's even closer. Now there's another interesting property that happens right down here, so I'm going to zoom in that window. So here, I've zoomed in, um, my window is 5555, five, 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 and you'll notice that every graph intersects at 0, 1, and that's true for the exponential functions when it's not transforming anywhere. And over here you'll see that they all don't start at the same place, and there's actually a little space in here, but they all intersect here. So knowing what we just found out, the properties of exponential functions where a is greater than 1, the properties are the domain is the set of all real numbers, there are no x-intercepts, the y-intercept is 1, the x-axis, y equals 0, is a horizontal asymptote as x approaches negative infinity, f of x equals a to the x, where a is greater than 1, is an increasing function, and is also 1 to 1. The graph of f contains the points 0, 1, 1, a, and negative 1, 1 over a. The graph of f is smooth and continuous with no corners or gaps. So let's look at this for a second. First of all, there are no x-intercepts. That means that this line gets closer, 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 but never reaches the x-axis. The horizontal asymptote is as x approaches negative infinity, and that's right here. So your horizontal asymptote is y equals 0, or the x-axis. The graph of f contains the point 0, 1, which is this guy, 1a and negative 1, 1 over a. So when we did f of x equals 2 to the x, 2 is our a. So we would have negative 1, 
1 half, 0, 1, and 1, 2. Those would all be on our graph. And then it's continuous. There are no holes, no corners, or no gaps. So let's graph these exponential functions. Can you kind of guess what's going to happen? Well, let's graph this first one, 1 half to the x. And I'm still on the 5, 5, 5, 5 window. Now look at that. It's the other side. Let's try the next one. Interesting enough, it's still intersecting at 0, 1. You can probably guess what's going to happen for the rest of these, so let me graph those together. And look at that. The larger the denominator gets, the closer it is to the y-axis. And you'll notice something else. They all intersect at 0, 1. So let's look at the properties of exponential functions. When a is between 0 and 1, that means it's a fraction. The domain is a set of real numbers. There are no x-intercepts. The y-intercept is 1. The x-axis, y equals 0, is a horizontal asymptote as x approaches infinity. f of x equals a to the x, where of course we said a has to be between 0 and 1, and it's decreasing function and is 1 to 1. The graph of f contains the point 0, 1, 1, a, and negative 1, 1 over a. The graph of f is smooth and continuous with no corners. And that's really what we found. So here is my my graph. The x-axis is a horizontal asymptote as x approaches infinity. So as x approaches infinity, it gets really, 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 really close to the x-axis, but it'll never reach it. This is a decreasing function, the decreasing graph. And when we graphed f of x equals 1 half to the x, negative 1, 1 over 1 half would be negative 1, 2, 0, 1, and 1 comma 1 half will all be on that graph. Graph exponential functions using transformations. Now hopefully you remember back to chapter 2 when we talked about transformations. We have this x plus 2 which would be our x plus h. Basically if you remember that shifts the graph of the function to the left 8 units. So the original function is 2 to the x this new function, the graph, will be shifted two places to the left. So let's see that in action. So here's my 2 to the x, and I'm going to graph it. And I still have it on the 5, 5, 5 window, which is a little easier to see. Now I'm going to graph 2 to the x plus 2. And you're going to notice it has shifted over two places. So let's talk about the number e for a couple of minutes. The number e is defined as the number that the expression 1 plus 1 over n to the n as it n approaches infinity. In calculus, this is expressed using limit notation. And this is what you're going to do the first thing when you enter calculus. It's the first chapter. But what really does that mean? Well, let's look at this chart. So here is our e. So when n is 1, we get 2. When n is 2, we get 2.25. And the larger n becomes, the closer it becomes to 2.718828, and so on. Basically, the larger it gets, it's just going to get really, really closer to 2.718828. And the reason we use e is it's the base of the natural logarithms. On your calculator, e will come up to 2.71828 and maybe a whole bunch of numbers after that. Interesting enough, the number e is not terminal. That means it goes on forever and never repeats. Before we start to solve exponential functions, it's really important that you remember the laws for exponential functions. Remember when you multiply, you add. When you have a power to a power, you multiply. Um, a, b to a power is a to the s and b to the s. Um, if you have a negative exponent, that's 1 over. One thing that's not on here is if you're dividing, you subtract. If you don't remember these or you have a hard time remembering them, definitely put this down in your notes and definitely have it on the cheat sheet for the test for chapter 5. 
let's solve exponential functions. And this is my absolute favorite thing to do. I love algebra. And so don't be shocked if you see this on the chapter five test or even on the final. One thing to remember though is if a to the u equals a to the v, that means their bases are the same, then their exponents are the same. So let's look at this first one. Five to the x equals five to the negative six. Well, I think we can see that x equals negative six in this case. And that's exactly what this is talking about. Now let's look at one that's a little more difficult. The problem is, is that our bases are not the same, but we can make them the same because I know that two squared is four. So the first thing I'm going to do is write two squared for my four. And remember that's still to the x squared equals two to the x. Okay, so I'm going to bring this up over here. When do I have a power to a power you multiply? So we have two to the two x squared equals two to the x. Well, now that I have the same base, I can make their exponents equal. So we'll have two x squared equals x. We want to make it equal to zero because we're going to probably have to factor here. So I'm going to subtract x from both sides. Now x is in common, so I'm going to take out an x, which leaves me with two x minus one equals zero. So now I'm actually going to have two answers. I'm going to have one x equals zero. And um, when two x minus one equals zero, um, I'm going to add one to both sides. So I have two x equals one. So x equals one half. So my two solutions are x equals zero and x equals one half. Let's continue to solve. So once again, I need the same base and I know five to the third is 125. So we're going to have five to the x squared plus eight equals now this is five to the third, so I'm gonna have five to the third to the two x power. Now remember when I have a power to a power, we're gonna multiply. So we have five x squared plus eight equals five to the six x. Well, now we're going to um, rewrite it without the bases. So we're going to have x squared plus eight equals six x. We're going to make it equal to zero because I can tell right now that I'm going to have to factor. So I'm going to subtract six x from both sides. Now I think, well, what multiplies to eight that would add to negative six? Well, I know that's negative four and negative two. So we're gonna make x minus four equal to zero. So one of my solutions is going to be four and then x minus two equals zero. And so my other solution will be two. These, I should say, are my solutions to the first equation. Let's try the next one. So I erased a little bit of the previous um, solution so I could have room for this guy. So once again, I need all of my bases to be the same. And it's gonna be three because I know that three squared is nine and that'll be to the two x. Three to the third is 27, 
and that's to the x squared. And then my base is already 3, so I'm just going to leave that to the negative 1. So now I have 3 to the 4x plus 3 to the 3x squared equals 3 to the negative 1. So I think I can squeeze it in here. We're going to have 3x squared plus 4x. So here's my 3x squared, my 4x, and I'm going to add 1 to both sides. So this is the equation that I'm going to have to solve. Now since we have a number here other than 1, we're going to do the AC method, or you might have heard it as the grouping method. So I take 3 times 1, which is 3, and I think, well, what multiplies to 3 that adds to 4? And of course, that's just 1 times 3. So we're going to have 3x squared plus, now we're going to take 1x plus 3x. And it doesn't matter if we put 3x plus 1x, we're still going to get the same answer. Plus 1 equals 0. We're going to look at the first two and say, well, what's in common with the first two? And that would be x. And so we have 3x plus 1. One. We look at the next two and we notice there isn't anything in common except 1. So we're going to pull out a 1, which leaves us with just 3x plus 1. Since these guys are the same, we're going to take that out, 3x plus 1. If I take it out of this one, I'm left with an x. If I take it out of this one, I'm left with a 1. And I'm slightly running out of room here, but 3x plus 1 equals 0. So when I solve it, x equals negative 1 third. And then x plus 1 equals 0. So x equals negative 1. And these are the solutions to this equation. Let's solve this exponential function. Now just because there's an e in there doesn't mean that these don't follow the same exponent rules. They do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this stuff together. So I have e to the 2x minus 1 equals, um, this stuff is going to go on top, so I'm going to have e to the negative 4x over e to the 3x. Now remember when we're dividing numbers that have exponents, you just subtract their exponents. So we have e to the 2x minus 1 equals e to the negative 4x minus 3x. So e to the 2x minus 1 equals e to the negative 7x. Since the bases are the same, we can make their exponents equal to each other. So let's put 2x minus 1 equals negative 7x. I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. I'm going to bring the x's over to the right side. So I have negative 1 equals negative 9x divide by negative 9. So x equals 1 ninth because a negative divided by a negative is a positive. So let's see if that's true. Let's pull up our calculator here. Okay, so here's our calculator, and let's put 1 ninth in for this x first. So you'll see we have e to the x right here next to our natural log, which makes sense. So second, e to the x. Now x is 2 times 1 divided by 9 minus 1. 
Okay, so that's that answer. Now let's see if it works for this one. This one's a little more tricky, but I'm actually going to use... So the second one is a little more tricky, but I am going to use e to the negative 7. And we get exactly the same answer. So we know that 1 ninth is the solution to this exponential function. Now we can also prove that graphically. We're going to make the left side y1 and the right side y2. So what I did is instead of writing all of this stuff and making it a bigger chance of error, I am just going to put e to the negative 7. So let's solve this graphically. So what I did is I put this into y1 and then I put e to the negative 7 into y2 just because if I put this in the chances of me making a mistake are much greater than putting e to the negative 7 in. And so this is what we have and I'm going to graph it and here are my two graphs. Now they intersect in here so let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to zoom in. Um, I'm going to make my window Let's make x min negative 2, x max 3, and then we're going to do the same for my y's. And we should be closer. Now we can definitely see it's in here, but let's actually find the solution, which means we want to find the intersection. So hopefully you remember this from the previous chapter. Go to intersect, and it'll say first curve, and then it'll pop to the second curve, and then your guess. And look at that. There's our answer right there. 0 0.459425 and so on. And if I do second quit, enter, you'll see that that was our answer from before. So here's a summary of what we just talked about. It is a very good idea to have this in your notes. Even a better idea to have it on your cheat sheet for the test and the final. So your assignment for 5.3 is the homework. Um, remember to check the calendar for the due dates. If you need more practice or help, please see the multimedia library in my math lab, the text or the ebook. And feel free to contact me by email because I can do a whole bunch more demonstrations of anything we've talked about.